Hello and welcome to our last uh, 110 acoustics session on <clears throat> the topic of acoustics. Um, what we're finishing today is unit three and we're finishing what's called complex sounds. Unit one being frequency, wavelength, speed of sound. Unit two being the decibel from L. And we spent the last couple of weeks on unit three, complex sounds. This finishes Today we finish Unit 3, and your midterm, I, I now know, in 110, is going to be covering Units 1, 2, and 3. And spring break is next week, so there will be no class, of course, next week. So hopefully by the end of this session you'll have all the information you require and need in order for a good, successful midterm exam. <clears throat> I will. Harumph. I will now share screen and go to our notes for today and to our PowerPoint for today. <clears throat> Here goes. So in our notes, what we covered last week, and we went through spectrum and waveforms, we know what that is, we whipped all the way down line, we talked about line versus continuous spectrum, we mentioned what a Fourier analysis was fundamental frequency, all these things put stars by. These are things we should know. Then we're talking about resonance, and we talked about opposition due to mass, opposition due to stiffness and resistance. Those three put together are called impedance, and impedance is the flip side of resonance. What isn't resonating is impeded. What isn't impeded is resonating. So we, these are all just descriptions of how sound travels through objects. And in, when we're looking at spectra, again over here at line versus continuous spectrum, those are two different kinds of spectrum, and I just want to highlight that for you just so we get a grip of it. Here is a line spectrum. It's showing you what might take place in a musical instrument where you have a fundamental frequency and then harmonics. It'll also show you what might happen in the human voice because the fundamental frequency of a male voice is about 125 hertz. And the fundamental frequency of a woman's voice is about 250 hertz. And then because the face is shaped like it is with our own mass and stiffness properties, we have harmonics that come out Okay, and the harmonics that come out are basically resonating things of the, of the fundamental frequency. And the same thing can be said of musical instruments. And so we highlight this slide here. Three different musical instruments. Again, they may or may not, but just as, as an example, you'll see the fundamental frequency being 300 hertz. And then you can see the harmonics of the fundamental frequency. And remember that harmonics are equal multiples of the fundamental frequency. And why do the musical instruments sound differently from each other? Well, because they're resonating, as you can follow my cursor, this one resonates at 900 hertz, and then it seems to resonate at 2100 hertz. Okay, whereas musical instrument B has different peaks of resonances. Now, when you're looking over here, at the very at the home at this, this slide, we're not showing any resonances taking place. These all seem to be dying off at a, at a, at a particular rate. Okay, but at any rate, it just gives you an idea. Okay, that resonating frequencies are shown by heights of the different harmonics. And this musical instrument C is going to have a different resonance. And so, if you take three different people, three different fellas. They may have a similar fundamental frequency of the voice, but each guy is going to sound different, his or her, his voice, their voices, because the, the, different, the heads are different, and the mass and stiffness qualities of Mike's heads are, is different from Jerry's head, which is different from Ted's head, okay? So you've got these different resonating uh, 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 characteristics, which makes for different sounds of voices. So anyway, looking at our notes here again, so really, I would put a star by this one here. You know, when you're looking at this section that I'm highlighting over here, have an idea, therefore. Working our way down, you should know what filters are. Okay, high pass, low pass, band pass, notch, reject. Okay, and then we talked about the properties of noise and know what noise being non-periodic. It's not 
tonal. Its waveform has no repetition quality over time. So when you're looking at noise, the waveform of noises, you see no pattern in that waveform whatsoever. So there's no tonality. I mean, very much unlike when you're looking at sound waves. Look at this bottom one, D. Okay, I can, I'm, it's formed by the addition of these three frequencies, but I can still see a pattern in its waveform. So it's gonna, this is a, a complex sound because it's of, composed of many frequencies, and it's going to have some tonality to it because you can see some rhythm or pattern in the waveform, unlike, of course, this situation here. Back to our notes. All right, and then we can talk about waveform versus spectra for broadband noise versus narrow bands of noise. And so we look over here at a different kind of a spectrum. Look at this one here. It's a, a broad band spectrum. It contains all frequencies underneath it, unlike this spectrum, which only contains the particular fundamental frequency and the particular harmonics and nothing in between. So the spectrum here is very different from a, a broadband spectrum here, okay, containing all sounds underneath, not just these harmonics, but everything. Or you can have a spectrum that has little energy in the low frequencies and much more energy in the high frequencies, okay? So look at now, now here's a line spectrum again. Individual harmonics are shown along with the fundamental frequency. Very different kind of spectrum than this one here. If we keep working our way down, here's the spectrum of speech. Now look at all the frequencies it's containing, all kinds of frequencies here, okay? Most energy in the low frequencies and less energy in the high frequencies. It's a broad band sound, okay? And here is two different spectra. White noise containing all the different frequencies at equal amplitude, so they just simply draw a line across, saying it's got everything in there, instead of drawing thousands of little lines this way, okay? And here's pink noise, another broadband spectrum. But see where it's, it's got most of its energy that noise has most of its energy in the low frequencies, and there's a high frequency drop off that you can see, okay? And here is, so here's the spectrum of speech. Here's pink noise. They have a similarity to them, don't you? Don't you see that? The drop off toward the high frequencies. Now, here is three examples of noises, white noise, low pass noise, and broad bandpass noise. So this is a, a the waveforms are all on the left, the spectra are on the right. So you've got this this white noise, it's got energy at all the frequencies and here's its actual spectrum. It's not such a nice clean line like is shown right here, okay? This is just to highlight like a schematic. The reality is okay, but it's still a broad flat spectrum showing fairly similar energy for all frequencies across. Low pass noise, meaning it's another waveform, no, it's no uh, periodicity to it, no pattern, so you know it's noise, okay, there's no tonality to it, and it's got most energy in the low frequencies and its spectrum, and then a drop off in the high frequencies. And here's a third kind of noise, and it's got a different waveform. Again, there's, I don't see a pattern in that waveform, so it's noise, but in this case, when they took a spectral analysis of it, a Fourier analysis, they found that, oh, look at most of its energy, it seems to be an, in a bandpass area confined to a, so this would be a narrow band of noise. Now, how does this relate to audiometry? In audiometry, when you're testing people's hearing, you might find a client who has excellent hearing in one ear and terrible hearing in the other ear. Now, your head can only hold so much sound before it spills over to the other side. If I put a ton of sound into my bad ear, by the time I put in about 50 decibels of sound, it's going to cross over to my good ear. If this ear is deaf, 
by the time I put in 50 decibels into my deaf ear, I'm going to hear the sound because it's crossed my skull to my good ear, to my good cochlea, and I'm going to raise my hand. So what am I going to do? I've got to keep the good ear busy with masking noise. And when I keep that good ear busy with masking noise, then I can find out the true hearing level of the bad ear. Okay, I'll find out that, hey, it's actually, if I didn't use masking, I would think I had a 50 decibel hearing loss in my bad ear. But if I keep masking noise in my good ear to keep it busy, I'll find out that 60 decibels is, or maybe 70 or maybe 80, maybe this ear has a 90 decibel hearing loss. Whereas if I didn't use masking, I would think it had a 50 decibel hearing loss. And masking noises are either broadband or narrowband. Okay, a broadband noise is used when you're masking for loud speech. When I'm doing speech testing and I'm talking loudly into the bad ear, I'm using pink noise because the spectrum of pink noise slopes down just like the spectrum of speech. And speech is a broadband complex sound, so I'm going to use a broadband spectrum sound to mask it. So I will use a broad band sound, and it's specifically pink noise. So none of these, I'll be using a spectrum that looks more like this, because the spectrum of speech is like this. And when I test pure tones, if I put a thousand hertz in the ear, or two thousand hertz in the bad ear, I'm going to use a narrow band of noise surrounding 2,000 hertz. And when I test this bad ear at 1,000 hertz, my narrow band of noise, follow my cursor, will be a narrow band of noise surrounding 1,000 hertz. And if I test the hearing sensitivity of my bad ear at 4,000 hertz, my narrow band of noise, follow my cursor, will surround 4,000 hertz. So all the stuff that I'm talking to you about has some relevance to clinical reality, and you will find this in audiometry. So when you're starting to take that course. All right, we keep moving to the, now we got to where we left off last week, and we went all the way to what we call beats. Now, beats, read this with me. If you hear two tones, if you add two tones that are far apart in frequency, you'll get a complex sound. You can tell a complex sound right away whenever you see a ripple in a waveform. Hmm, what does that mean? Well, look at here. Look at this. Kind of a jagged waveform, but I still see a pattern in it. Okay? And we'll go and look at another sound wave, and I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about here. Let's see. Well, let's go over to hmm, here. Look at that bottom wave. Look at wave number four. It's made from the addition of this wave plus this one, plus this one, plus this one. And you can see the spectra here, 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 and here. Now you see the, the combination spectrum. And you can see here's that waveform. Does it have tonality? Yep, you betcha. I can see a pattern in it. And I can also see this weird ripple, you know, there's a, but there's a pattern to it. So here's what's really weird. If I'm playing this complex sound and I take away the fundamental frequency, as in the bottom here, the waveform will change, okay? So I've taken the, the fundamental frequency here, and the waveform does look a little bit different, but basically I'm still going to hear an overall frequency of 200 hertz. Kind of weird, but nonetheless, that's called the case of the missing fundamental. <laughs> Anyhow, here's another weird looking waveform, but don't look at that one. Next, okay, here's another complex sound. Here's another sound wave, okay, and it's made from the addition of three sound waves. 100 hertz on the right, 200 hertz. 300 hertz, and look at the black dots now. Look at A. Follow my cursor down. In wave, the top wave, the wave is condensed. In the middle wave, you're getting it right at zero degrees phase. And at the bottom wave, I'm at a rarefacted phase. And when you add those three up together, you got nothing. 
okay? Because you have condensed, rarefacted. We said when you add that together, you have the sound of one hand clapping. They've canceled each other out. And when you're adding nada to it, you got nothing. So that's why the wave is right there. And look at B now. It's rarefacted here. It's nothing. It's condensed. And once again, you're basically at about nothing. And look at C. You're condensed. You're nothing. You're rarefacted again. And looky, looky, there you are. Okay? So the combinations make things happen. But if, you've, if you were like having a situation where the waves were all condensed at one time, you get a big thing. Now, let me just describe this to you. Have you ever sat on a bus and watched the windshield wipers on a bus? You're on a city bus. I don't know why they do this, but the windshield wipers, in your car, they stay doing this. But for some reason on buses, one motor is a little bit faster than the other motor. So you'll start to see this. And then finally, they're opposite. They're doing this. And then finally, they'll fall out of that pattern, and eventually, they'll be doing this completely, just for a while, though. And all of a sudden, they'll... <laughs> and I like to watch that. It's really weird. It's because one's going a little bit faster than the other. And what's happening is there will be a time when they're completely in phase, and there will be another time when they're completely out of phase. All right? Now, this is what I mean by beats. If you play a 1,000 hertz tone and a 1,001 hertz tone, the, the, the connection of their being in phase and being out of phase, that's going to happen once a second. So what you're going to hear if you play a 1,000 hertz tone and a 1,001 hertz tone, you're going to hear one beat per second. Whoa, whoa. If you play a 1,000 hertz tone and a 1,002 hertz tone, you're going to hear two beats a second. Whoa, 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 whoa. You play a 1,000 hertz tone and a 1,005 hertz tone, you're going to hear whoa, 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 five beats a second. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay? Until they get further apart and further apart, and all of a sudden you're going to think, you say, I hear two separate tones. Huh, I actually hear two different frequencies. But if they're really close together, I won't really hear my, my system, my hearing system can't resolve it. I haven't got the resolution in my inner ear to resolve 1,000 hertz and 1,001 hertz. I can't do it. I'm going to hear one beat per second. It's only when they get to be further apart that I'll begin to hear, oh, there's actually two beats per second. Or not, not, not two beats. There's actually two different frequencies. Okay, so when they're close together, I can't resolve it. Think about looking at a fluorescent light. Did you know that when you look at a fluorescent light, it's blinking 60 times a second? It's going on and off 50 times a second. Your eyes can't see that, though. You haven't got the ability to resolve that. So it just looks like the light is on. Okay, your body isn't perfect. We can't, we're not machines. And that's what gets us into the unit four after your midterm. We'll be talking psychoacoustics, and that's the human perception of sound. That's where you're starting to move away from just the ethics of sound, and you're looking into, hmm, instead of talking about the intensity, we'll be saying, how loud was it? Loudness is the perception of intensity. And when it comes to frequency, you'll say, what's the pitch? Pitch is the perception of frequency. See, artsy farts and musicians talk about pitch. Scientists talk about frequency. Okay, the artsy people talk about, oh, that was loud. The scientist says that was very intense. Okay, so there's the objective and the subject. Anyway, enough on that. We'll talk more about that next week, or I should say in two weeks' time. That's psychoacoustics, but beats. Okay, so let's go to this next slide and have a look here. Here's a sound wave. It's a complex wave, and the frequencies are far apart. You can see on the spectrum. So you'll hear two separate tones. But here, look at this spectrum. The, the frequencies are really close together. And see, you can see a time when they're completely in phase and then out of phase, and then in phase and then 
out of phase. And so the waveform will be going wow, 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 wow. So if it's a 1,000 hertz tone and a 1,001 hertz tone, this bubble is going to happen one time a second. If it's a 1,000 hertz tone and a 1,002 hertz tone, you're going to have two of these bubbles happening per second. Remember, time is on the horizontal and amplitude is on the vertical when you're looking at a waveform. Now here's a weird looking wave, and it's called a sawtooth wave. It looks just like a ding dong sawtooth. <laughs> All right, look at that. Now that's a unique type of complex wave because it too is made from an addition of, com of, of, of simple sinusoids according to a certain rule. And the rule has to be very held completely tight. You can't change the rule. The sound wave that has to be some frequency on the top, and then the second frequency has to decrease in amplitude by a certain amount, and it's got to be double the frequency. And then this wave here, okay, it's got to be higher in frequency again, and it has to be smaller in intensity yet. And when you start adding wave one and two, and then one, two, and three, you can see here, complex made out of this one, plus this one, plus this one. Complex wave one is made out of this wave and this wave. Complex wave two is made out of the all three together. And complex wave here, that's made out of a whole bunch of, of complex sounds that are following this rule on the left. Weird. And here's what the rule is. If my fundamental frequency is 100 hertz, I've got to start adding equal multiples of that fundamental, and they have to drop off at a certain dB per octave rate. And then I will get a sawtooth wave. Hmm. Look at this one, a square wave. If I have a sound wave on the top here, and I add another one and add another one according to a different set of rules, my complex wave here on the top, complex one is made from the addition of this simple wave and this simple wave. And this complex wave, C2, is made out of the addition of the, this simple one, this one, and this one. And now you can start to see the wave is starting to look square. And this complex wave is made from the addition of all four of these guys. And so you're really starting to see the square. And the bottom one is saying, let's just do that ad, ad nauseum. Let's just keep on following that rule. What rule would that be? Well, look at this. Here's your fundamental frequency, but you're not adding the next harmonic. You're skipping it. You're adding the second harmonic. And then you're skipping the next one, you're adding the next harmonic. And you're skipping this one and you're adding the next one. And your dB per octave drop-off follows a certain rule again. Look at this one. This is a triangular wave. A triangular wave. And it's made by adding together again, really dropping off your energy at a certain rate, but you're doing every other harmonic. Now notice here, the drop-off here is less than the drop-off here. Okay, so you're getting a different kind of wave again. I'm just giving you an example of three different weird-looking complex waves, a sawtooth, a square, and a triangular, but obviously we don't walk around hearing those kind of sounds all the time. They don't sound so weird, they're just kind of weird-looking waves. Okay, so here's a adding sinusoids together to make a triangular wave. Adding sinusoids together to get a sawtooth wave. Adding, look at this, you're looking at the spectrum and the spectrum. See the drop-off rate in this case is the same in terms of intensity, but here you're adding all the harmonics, and here you're skipping one. In this case, you'll get a sawtooth, and in this wave, you'll get a square. Do -de -do -do. All right, and here's another shot showing you a whole bunch of weird looking complex waves. So on the top is your simple sinusoid. Whoa, don't want that one. Simple sinusoid. And it's got one frequency. And on a spectrum, one frequency. 
Don't worry about this whole phase spectrum stuff. I couldn't care less. Leave it. Just, just drop it. Look at sawtooth. You made that wave by adding a fundamental and then all the harmonics at a certain drop-off rate. And a square wave, same thing as the sawtooth, except you avoided every other harmonic. And then the triangular wave, you also avoided every other harmonic, but the drop-off rate was more than the square. Now, please don't think you need to memorize this, okay? I couldn't care less if you memorize this or not. That's not the issue, okay? So you're going to see these waves described at the bottom of page two here, and you'll just see it. Square wave, triangular, sawtooth. But now look at the speech waveform. I put a star by that puppy. Because your speech waveform is kind of like a combination of a sawtooth wave and a triangular wave. And your face, okay, faces act like horns. And they're going to resonate with certain frequencies, essentially. The horn of your mouth has a radiation effect. Now, what does Sam Hill do I mean by that? Well, let me get a piece of paper here. Because the drop-off rate of the speech spectrum from the larynx would be pretty steep, about 12 decibels per octave. But if I roll up a horn, and if I talk into the wide end of a horn, you just hear the low pitches. But if I talk into the small end of a horn, now you hear the high pitches. Well, in a weird way, your face is like a horn, and it increases the high frequencies, and it increases it at plus 6 dB per octave instead of dropping. So the steep 12 dB per octave drop-off from the larynx is offset by the radiation effect of your face as a horn, because your mouth is wider than your larynx, and therefore, Minus 12, or 12 drop-off per octave, add 6 to that, now your drop-off is minus 6. So that's pink noise, the drop-off per octave. So that's, the, that's what makes the speech spectrum have its particular slope. All right, share screen again here. Let's look at our notes and see where we are. We're at the bottom of page 2. It's time to wind this topic to a close. Speech as a complex sound. This is the most important sound for our hearing aid wearers. It's all about speech. The fundamental frequency in a male voice is 125 hertz. Put a star by that. In a female voice, it's about 250. In a child's voice or a baby's voice, around 500. And then formants are resonances of the vocal tract. Vocal tract is your throat and your mouth. It's 17 centimeters from your voice to your lips in the average adult. The voice quality. Each larynx may produce a similar fundamental frequency, but each face has different mass and stiffness properties shaped differently. Therefore, the resonances or the formants, which are resonances of your vocal tract, are different from person to person. You can think of the larynx as the reed and the face as the horn. Really, you can. And let's just look at some pictures that we might have here. Okay? Kind of weird. Your face, we have two quarter wave resonators. These are called quarter wave resonators. Like a cup, like I always talk about, like a cup, open at one end, closed at the other end. Here's a cylinder, top left. Cylinders that are closed at one end are going to resonate with sound waves that are four times their length. In our bodies regarding speech and hearing, we have two. The ear canal is a quarter wave resonator and the vocal tract is a quarter wave resonator. Just thought I'd let you know. Here you go. Here's your larynx. When you're looking down at a larynx, L-A-R-Y-N-X, larynx, 
Never call it a voice box again, okay? Because it doesn't have a bunch of strings going across it. Your larynx, when you're looking down at the top, it's got two folds, and the folds are joined together at one end, and they're open at another end. Now, this is really kind of cool. I'm going to show you something here. I'm going to take a piece of paper. I'm going to stop sharing for a second. I'm going to take a piece of paper, and I'm going to fold it in half. Why don't we just do that? And I'm going to, yeah, let's try the, let's try it this way. I think I'll fold it this way. And I'll tear in half. So now I have two strips. If I have the two strips of paper, watch what happens when I blow through them. They stick together. They don't blow apart. They stick together. And that's because when I'm blowing through them, the air pressure is less. And they're sucked together. It's just like an airplane wing. An airplane wing. When you look at an airplane wing from the side, it's actually shaped like that when you're looking at it from the side. And the air is rushing underneath it, and it's rushing over the top of it. Okay, so you're thinking of the airplane is going, okay, the airplane is heading in this direction. Okay, and, the, and the, so it's heading in this direction, and the air is blowing over the top and blowing underneath the bottom. Well, the distance over the top is bigger than the distance over the bottom. And because that distance is bigger, the air is going faster over the top of the wing than it is on the bottom of the wing. Therefore, the wing is sucked upwards. That's what makes a plane go up. It's not just because the wing is on an angle like that, and like when you have your hand outside the door, the window of a car, and you do this, and it makes your hand go up. That's not really what makes a plane's wing go up, okay? It's called the Bernoulli effect, B-E-R-N-O-U-L-L-I, Bernoulli. It is the Bernoulli effect, the Bernoulli, B-E-R-N-O-U-L-L-I, Bernoulli. I didn't make it up. This is what it's called. Okay. So anyway, what does that have to do with the larynx? Back to the larynx. When you're looking at the larynx, air is rushing through it. And so the folds are closed, okay, and then the air rushes through and the folds open. And because the air rushes through, it sucks them closed. And then the air builds up underneath again and poof, pushes them open. And that pushing, now the air is blowing through and it sucks them closed. And I'll show it to you larger here, okay? Building up together underneath, it blows them apart. Now that, the, now that they're blown apart, the air rushes through the middle, sucks them closed. Air pressure builds up, blows them apart. The rushing air between them now sucks them back again. That happens in a guy 125 times a second. That happens in a woman about 250 times a second. That is the fundamental frequency of the human voice. Okay? Now, back to sharing screen. Look at the pictures of the musical instrument. Here's the strings on a guitar moving back and forth. And you've got the body of the guitar resonating with that fundamental frequency producing harmonics. And the harmonics are at certain heights showing the resonances due to the mass and stiffness of the guitar body. And it's the same with speech. The larynx is right where I'm drawing with my cursor here. And the face is a horn. Here's your nasal cavities. And here's your oral cavity. And those two cavities are the resonating chambers of your head. Just thought I'd let you know. So here's your vocal folds in operation over time. Blown open and closing and then blowing open again. Boom. Successive time frames are illustrated from left to right. I'm showing you a close-up. The larynx. Vocal folds, that's what they call them, vocal folds. These are your vocal folds. And you have two, and they're blowing open and slamming shut. Blowing open, slamming shut. 
many, many times per second. This is a picture showing you the waveform of the human voice, much like a, kind of like a triangular wave and then a bit like a sawtooth in a weird way. Here's your vocal folds closed. Here they are blowing open. Okay. And this is just a complicated picture showing you the waveforms over time and the spectra of the human voice. And it drops off at about 12 dB per octave, but due to the horn effect of the face, that cancels out. So the drop off is kind of like my cursor going like this. Pink noise. Pink. Here's just showing you more spectra. Okay, here's the drop off rate. Anyway. Boring. Oh, let's see. Carry on. Oh, yeah. Let's look at the outer ear. But before we do that, let's make sure we've got this stuff down here. Look at your vowels. This is from last week and the week before. Make sure you circle this and really make it your friend. Okay? Honestly. Vowels on the left, unvoiced consonants on the right, and a mixture in between. And I'm going to highlight that and bring it even closer so you really see it, okay? Because this is really important to grasp. Vowels are, here's your A, E, I, O, U, okay? They're periodic, they're tonal, they're low frequency. When you look at the opposite end, unvoiced consonants, F, S, P, T, C, H, K, say these. S, P, T, Ch, K, unvoiced. They are non-periodic. They are noises. They are high frequency. So the noises in speech are mostly high frequency. Now look at the middle column. V, that's just an F with a voice. Look at the letter S. S, S. Now put a voice in it. Z, Z, you have a Z. Look at P, P as in Peter P, or Paul. P, P. Put a voice in P. Ball. Paul. Ball. B. B is a voiced p, p. And when you look at T, t Ted, Ted, put a D in it, a voice in T, in the T. Dead, dead, Ted, dead. Ted is dead. <laughs> okay. T, t, put a voice in a T, D, D. CH, church, church. Okay. Put a voice in ch, J, J, judge. J, ch, ch, j. Take a K. K, K. Put a voice in it. If you say could, could, K, K. put a voice in it. Good, good, K, G, K, G. See, we make what we do with when we speak. There's basically three areas of constriction in speech. The first one is the lips. The next one is putting your tongue behind your front teeth. Okay, further back. The front is the lips, and then in the middle. And then the back, the back of your tongue against the roof of your mouth. Okay, so front, middle, back. And they call that in speech pathology the diadocal kinesis. It's the putica, putica, front, middle, back. Front, middle, back. Front, middle, back. That's why the nursery rhyme, patty cake, patty cake, p -t -t -t, is good for kids. Teaches them articulation. Teaches them speaking. Okay? P patty cake, patty cake, baker's man, patica, patica, front, middle, back, front, middle, back. So when you bend, but that's speech pathology. They study that at MSU. Now, don't worry about it. Here's what we're talking about. Hearing aids are as dumb as a stick, okay? They are amplifiers on the ear. And they don't understand language. They just understand acoustics, okay, sounds. They just process sounds. 
They amplify sounds. So what we're doing in this lesson today is we're not looking at the meaning of speech. We're looking simply at the acoustics of speech, sheerly the acoustics. And that's why we're breaking it down into voiced sounds, unvoiced sounds, voiced sounds on the left that are periodic, tonal, low frequency, unvoiced sounds that are noise, non-periodic, and high frequency, and then sounds in the middle. So, and then you can have front, middle, back. P and B are front sounds, lip sounds. T and D are behind the front teeth, middle ones, okay? And then G, K, and G are ones that are way back. So, and then you have combinations of them. You have ch, sh, d, and all that. So, and anyways, the, now that's just breaking down speech into its acoustics. And most of the energy of speech, and as we go back here, I'm going to look it over here, the energy of speech is mostly vowels, low frequency tonal sounds would be here. High frequency consonants would be here. They are softer. Okay, you can see there's less energy here. And in the middle would be the voiced consonants. So your A, E, I, O, U are louder and lower. Okay, L and L, that's how you should think of them, loud and low. High frequency consonants are high pitched and soft. So what happens with hearing loss? You can't hear soft sounds. So what's the first sounds you miss? The high frequency consonants. And think of the words hat, sat, bat, cat. They all have a, a, a. I mean, let's face it. You have five vowels in the English language, and you have thousands of words, and every English word has a vowel. There's not one single word out there without a vowel. So all our thousands of words have to share five vowels. So vowels don't tell you jack about what the word was. Vowels just pick up speech and throw it across the street. Vowels just carry the energy. Vowels are the loud part of speech. It's the soft consonants that tell you what the word is. Did they say dishes or fishes? Kittens or mittens? Okay, hat, fat, cat, bat, sat. It's the k that tells you what the word is. This is the acoustics of speech, and it is the reason why elderly people say young people mumble. It's because they've got trouble hearing treble. They can't hear the high frequencies of speech. And when you can't hear the high frequencies of speech, you have difficulty telling what the word is. And that's why hearing aids need to take that frown, okay, hearing aids need to take that frown of not being able to hear the high pitches and they have to turn that frown upside down with hearing aids that literally do emphasize the high frequencies. And we'll be coming back to horns because actually horns have been used in hearing aids, tiny little ones. Okay, they increase high frequencies. But we also do it digitally, of course. Hearing aids are digital today. So at any rate, let's finish this topic. So we'll go to our notes here and now look at the vocal tract as a quarter wave resonator. Okay, the vocal tract or even the ear as a quarter wave resonator. Both of them are cylinders and both are closed at one end. So here you go. All right. How long is your ear canal? About one inch long. So what is it going to resonate with? Sound waves four times that length, four inches. Okay. How long is, is four inches? About a third of a foot. Well, remember your formulas from unit one. I'll draw it for you. Frequency equals wavelength or equals speed of sound over wavelength. Let me just make sure I've written this nice and then I'll show it to you here so you can just see it. Okay. Speed 
of sound over wavelength. Okay, frequency equals speed of sound over wavelength. And we also said wavelength equals speed of sound over frequency. Okay, it's just like saying uh, ten, uh, uh, 5 is equal to 10 over 2, or it could be said that 2 is equal to 10 over 5. Same thing. Okay? Same thing. I'll show it to you all here. It's the same thing. You're just flipping things around. Now hold that truth down, okay? Because now we're going to talk about the way the quarter wave resonator of the ear canal and the quarter wave resonator of your voice. So first, the quarter wave resonator of your ear canal. Frequency, what frequency is it going to resonate? Sound waves that are four times its length, four inches long. What's the speed of sound in air? 1130 feet per second. Okay, so and uh, over, okay, so, so the frequency is speed of sound over the wavelength. 1130 feet per second divided by four inches. But you can't talk apples and oranges. You have to change inches into feet. So four inches is a third of a foot. So take 1130 feet per second divided by 0.3. And you do the math. I'll do that in a second here. 1130 feet per second divided by 0.3. And I'm going to get about I don't know, you can't see it, but it says 3,766. 3,766. Okay, now let's do it in centimeters. What's the, what's the length of your ear canal in centimeters? About two and a half. What's four times two and a half? Ten. What's the speed of sound in meters per second? 340 meters per second. So frequency equals 340 meters per second divided by 10 centimeters. Well, oh, hang on again. Just like we couldn't with feet and inches, we have to make them both talk the same language. Well, what's 10 centimeters? 0.1 meters. So what's 340 meters per second divided by 0.1? 340 divided by 0.1 equals, and in this case, I get 3,400. Okay? So either way, it's up in the 30s. It's up like 3,000 something. Well, that is the resonance of your outer ear canal. Your outer ear canal has a resonating frequency of around 3,500 hertz. Okay, so if I click on this guy here, right there. But your ear canal is flesh and bone. And so that resonance is spread because your ear canal is not a cup. Okay, it's not made out of glass. It's not made out of steel. So it would normally resonate at around 3,500 hertz. 3,400, something like that, but that resonance is spread, and look where it's spread, right over top, that's a comp, of the high frequency consonants. Here's an audiogram. Here's how we test hearing, okay? 125 hertz, 250, 500, 1, 2, 4, and 8. Seven, seven octave frequencies. And look at the letters of speech, all the voiced sounds, Z, V, J, M, D, B, Z, V, and all your vowels, A, E, I, O, U, are louder and lower. And now look at Ch, Ch, K, F, S, F. They're higher and they're softer. And some of these high-pitched sounds are turbulent. Like, they're continuous noise. And some of them are transient, like, and that would be, but either way, they're non-tonal, they're non-periodic, they're high up in frequency, okay? They are noises. They might be turbulent, they might be transient, but by gum, they're noise. Okay, so the reason you have the ear canal resonance that we talked about as a quarter wave resonator is to help us hear the high frequencies of speech. That's why your ear has the shape it does. It was made to match 
the voice. Okay, but when you've got hearing loss, look at the X's and O's. This person has good hearing in the low frequencies and poorer hearing in the highs. So now this resonance isn't enough to help him hear those high frequency sounds. So now he needs hearing aids to amplify the treble sounds. Essentially, that's the general gist and finish of this whole slideshow. But let's end on a comical note here. Let's look at speech. Screening has, screen sharing has stopped at the, as the shared window has closed. Well, why not? Let's just do this now. Let's just share a screen. Back to your notes. And let's look at why helium speech. Why when you breathe a helium balloon, how come your speech gets higher? Do -do -do -do. Breathe a helium balloon. <sighs> okay, and now you talking really high up in pit, it, 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 and it lasts only a few seconds and then it's gone again. Well, your vocal tract is a quarter wave resonator. Frequencies four times the length are going to make it resonate. So, helium speech. Why does helium make your voice sound higher? Well, the length of your resonating vocal tract is 17 centimeters. What's 4 times 17? 68 centimeters. What's 68 centimeters? 0.68 meters. Frequency equals wavelength over the, or speed of sound over the wavelength. Wavelength equals speed of sound over the frequency. Here we have the wavelength, 0.68. And you're, want, you're wanting to know the frequency. So, okay, wavelength equals speed of sound over the frequency, or frequency equals speed of sound over the wavelength. I could have put, you know, this formula a different way, but just look at it here, okay? So, wavelength is speed of sound over frequency, and that's X. That's what you're trying to find. So, simply cross multiply. 1 times 340, 340 divided by 0.68 will give you X. Just like 5 over 1 is equal to 10 over 2. You're just flipping things around. So speed of sound in air is 340 meters per second. 340 meters per second divided by 0.68 is about 500 hertz. Okay. That would be a resonating frequency of your vocal tract with air. Because your voice is, your vocal tract is a quarter wave resonator. Well, now breathe in helium. And when you breathe in helium, Okay, speed helium has less density than air. Helium is a lighter gas. And the speed of sound is, goes slower through more dense objects. So it's going to go faster through helium. So helium has a sound, a speed of sound is 920 meters per second. So now 920 meters per second divided by 0.68. And now you're getting 1,362 hertz. Okay, so that's why your voice gets higher with helium. The speed of sound is faster through helium than it is through air. And wavelength is speed of sound divided by frequency. Frequency is speed of sound divided by wavelength. So and if I pull this back a little bit and make it smaller here, one could have done this. I could have just simply said, I could have done, uh, I think I'll draw it this way. Frequency equals 340 meters per second over the wavelength, and that would be frequency equals 340 meters per second over 0.68. I'll show it to you here. Okay, just showing it to you another way. So if the wavelength is 0.68, take 340 meters per second divided by 0.68, and you'll get around 500 hertz. All right, what happens now? Frequency equals 340 meters per, se per second over the wavelength. And now we'll, we're going to say, you know, 340 meters. Now we're going to say 927 meters per second because it's helium over 0.68. Okay, now that you've got 927 meters per second instead of 340 meters per second divided by 0.68. Now you end up with a much higher frequency. And that is why your voice gets higher on helium. Two examples of the outer ear canal being a quarter wave resonator, your vocal tract being a quarter wave resonator. It's important to understand the interrelationship of acoustics with both of these pieces of anatomy.
It's called speech and hearing. And the most calm, the most interested sound that people want to hear is that of speech. That's what people are more interested in hearing. It's all about communication. And so we need to understand as clinicians, your outer ear has a certain resonance that naturally increases the high frequencies of speech. Your voice has a unique characteristic, male fundamental frequency, female fundamental frequency. Heads are different, horns are different. So you're gonna have different resonates, resonatings, and that's why, or resonances, and that's why Ted is gonna sound different from Ed, okay? And Paul will sound different from Saul, even though they're both guys, okay? So it's all about mass, stiffness, understanding, basically, acoustics. All right, I will stop here, because I believe we have now reached the bottom of page three in our notes. So when you're looking at presbycusis, speech on a spectrum, okay, make sure you remember, you look at this and look at it well. Okay, read that to yourselves. Vowels simply carry. They just tell you that someone's talking. Consonants tell you what someone's saying. What was the word? And look at this word, presbycusis. Presbyterian, church of the elders. Presbyopia, your arms aren't long enough to see the page. You can't see stuff close up. Hit you when you're 40. Presbycusis, hearing loss for the high frequencies. Presbycusis, hearing loss in the elderly. Here's presbycusis, dropping down. Okay, better hearing in the lows. The guy can hear at 15 decibels, 25, but when you get to the high frequencies, it takes around 50 to 60 for the guy to just barely hear. The X's are the left ear, the O's are the right ear, and this is the audiogram shown with the natural outer ear canal resonances on top which help you naturally hear the softer high frequency consonants, which are all important for discerning what the speech was. And the resonance of your outer ear canal is laid out over there too. Okay, same logic as my formulas as you learned earlier. So there you have it. All right, important to know, and remember these formulas here, it's all the way, remember how the interrelationship goes. F is speed of sound over wavelength. Wavelength is speed of sound over frequency. And just realize they can just be flipped around. You can figure out the answer from either formula. Does not matter. They're both the same thing. Remember, it's like saying 5 is equal to 10 over 2 or saying 2 is equal to 10 over 5. Okay, that's all the relationship is. Do not make yourselves think that this is any more difficult or confusing than you need to because it's simply sixth grade math. Anyway, we are done. We have concentrated on looking at speech, the most important complex sound that we want to hear. All right. Have a good midterm break or a mid uh, a spring break or whatever, and uh, take your midterm exam. I believe Lynn Royer has said that it is af actually not proctored after all. If you look at your canvas or look at your announcements or your notes, I should say your emails, I got an email to that effect, so be sure to check it. Okay, Write the midterm earlier rather than later so that you can enjoy spring break. All right, I will stop sharing, I will say adios, I will stop recording, and I will talk to you in two weeks' time. All right, live long and prosper.